Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. This is Stacey Elliott at RioSense, and today's topic is going to be about injectability. So we've addressed this topic in the past from a more probably theoretical perspective. Um, however, today we wanted to do it in a more um, practical way, so giving you more information to help you go through the process step by step. Um, I will warn you, though, we will still have some equations to deal with, um, but we'll get through that. Um, so let's get started. So just a quick overview of what we're going to cover. Um, I want to give you a friendly reminder at the very beginning that viscosity is not one number. Um, and the reason I bring this up is that you want to really um, measure the viscosity that's right for your application. Measuring at a single temperature or a single shear rate may not really be the best uh, option for you and may mislead you when you actually go to, to do the interpretation. So we're going to have a friendly reminder about viscosity is not one number. So then after we you know, think about that, um, first step is to really you know, establish what are the potential delivery parameters um, for your syringe system and then use those to plan our experiments um, so that we get the data that's going to be most valuable um, for the prediction. After this, um, because as we see, as we'll see, uh, proteins, which is you know probably our biggest audience here, people dealing with proteins and antibodies um, at therapeutic levels are quite often non-Newtonian. And so we want to handle uh, how to correct the non-Newtonian data and get the proper data to use in our analysis. And then finally, we want to perform the appropriate uh, injection force calculation. So is this for a Newtonian sample, non-Newtonian? Um, and, and how do we know? So that's sort of the general overview. So let's get going. So what I first want to you know, remind everyone, uh, viscosity, it's basically a stress response to uh, applied deformation, this applied deformation being characterized by shear rate, which is essentially a velocity, gra velocity gradient perpendicular to the flow direction. Um, and viscosity can depend on shear rate and will depend on temperature. So I bring this up with some supporting data just to remind you that when you're prepping um, to collect data, you want to plan accordingly and try to measure at the appropriate shear rate for your application and the appropriate temperature for your application. So just as some examples here, um, and all of this data is on a model protein at uh, high concentrations or therapeutic levels. So on the left here, we have viscosity as a function of shear rate for multiple samples. Um, some of these are same concentration, different buffers, some are diluted slightly. Uh, the point being though, that as we vary the shear rate, we see for all of these that they have a low shear Newtonian plateau, but then at some point, all of them begin to shear thin. Um, so if you're doing your experiments, um, you know, as a single point experiment where you're looking at one shear rate, say 1000 inverse seconds, that's very common for some of our customers, um, Yet your application, you know, is telling you that you need to know what's going on at, say, in excess of 10,000 inverse seconds, um, where the material has clearly started to shear thin. Now, your, your, your data is not going to be informative for you. So bear in mind that when you're setting up experiments, you want to set them up properly. Another thing to think about is the temperature dependence. So viscosity will depend on temperature as well, typically at least over um, certain ranges of temperature, it will have an Arrhenius dependence or exponential with inverse in temperature. So the point here being if uh, what you really need to measure or what you really need to know in terms of your application is the behavior at 20C and you're measuring at 25C, um, this is a nearly five centipoise difference or um, 25 to 30% difference in the viscosity. So this is going to be important to pick your temperature according to the application and also the shear rate according to the application. This is what gives you the best prediction, um, you know, when you go to use, utilize your data. So with that in mind, let's start thinking about uh, the injectability and how we can plan for our experiments um, with respect to these parameters. So you want to look at, uh, you know, upfront, identify what are the possible syringe and delivery parameters that you can use. And this may be very fixed or it may be flexible. Um, in which case you can calculate uh, rather than a single shear rate, a range of shear rates that would work for you. So the things that we're going to need to consider, and these are going to pop up when we start doing the calculations, are the, um, the needle length. And just to point out sort of a tip, I've noticed that when we're working with some of our customers to help them uh, predict injectability, uh, it's important to look at the, the diagrams of your um, syringe system, because oftentimes 
I think people will take the length of the needle to be the length of the needle that's exposed. But in many cases, the needle does actually um, penetrate into this transition piece. Um, so you want that true, uh, true length of the needle, even if it's not exposed, um, because that will change the, the prediction quite a bit. In addition to this, you want to know the needle gauge, which would then give you the inner radius of the needle, the uh, radius of the piston or the barrel, and then the, the volumetric flow rate. So how rapidly do you want to deliver a particular volume of your, your product? So using these um, you know, to prep for your experiments, you'd want to estimate what would the shear rate in the needle be. Now, you know, going in without any knowledge of how the samples will behave, you, you basically have to do this using the Newtonian expression. Um, for flow in, in a cylinder or something with a circular cross-section, which is fine. It's going to give you a good gauge to give you a, a measurement range. And so the, the fluid mechanics for this particular flow situation have been worked out, and so it's very easy to, to find the expression for the shear rate in the needle um, at the wall. It's just going to depend on the volumetric flow rate and the inner radius of the needle. So knowing this, ideally, when you now go to plan your experiments, you would want to, if possible, measure viscosity as a function of shear rate up to and maybe even slightly beyond this predicted shear rate um, that we've just calculated from our, our syringe and delivery parameters. Now, I understand that that's not always possible. Um, in, in many cases, that's not possible for us either. But it is, um, as we'll see when we actually get to the end and are looking at some of our experimental data, you can cautiously uh, predict injectability by extrapolating the data a bit. Um, you wouldn't want to go too far, but, um, you know, and there's always some risk with that, but you can, you can certainly do that to get at least a better estimate than you would if you just assume fully Newtonian. Um, and then also, as we mentioned, you want to uh, try to pinpoint down what temperature is relevant for you too, because that can shift the viscosity quite a bit. So with that in mind, you'd want to go um, forward and, and do your measurements over the broadest range of shear rates possible, encompassing, you know, what you're predicting, and then the appropriate temperature. Um, so we're going to have a, a intervening slide here before we get on to, you know, once we've collected the data and we've found that perhaps it's non-Newtonian, as it often is for high concentration um, therapeutic products, um, how are we going to handle that? So this correction is specific to our technology. Um, so our technology is a microfluidic visco base viscometer. So we're looking at flow through a rectangular flow channel. and you know, we, we always emphasize that viscosity is always calculated. And, you know, when we're doing our calculation, when the software is doing the calculation, we don't know ahead of time whether it is or is not non-Newtonian and how to handle the correction ahead of time. So the initial data that comes out from our systems um, will actually be assuming the Newtonian behavior. So just to quickly review our system so that you can better understand um, the approximation uh, or the assumptions that we make and why the correction is required, so if we look at our, our microfluidic flow channel and we're pumping fluid through the channel, um, we're controlling the volumetric flow rate Q, so that is correctly controlled. And we're measuring using the four pressure sensors that um, are distributed along the length of the flow channel, we're measuring the pressure drop across the flow channel. So we get the pressure gradient as the fluid flows through. So because as I stated, and ahead of time we have no idea what the viscosity profile of the fluid would look like. So to initially get the viscosity data, we have to assume something, and we assume that it's Newtonian. So to initially calculate the shear rate, um, we use the Newtonian assumption. And in this case, W and H are just uh, respectively channel width and channel depth or height. Um, now we're measuring this pressure gradient, and we too have to measure the, or rather calculate the stress, again, using channel dimensions. Um, but this, is uh, the, no assumptions are, are made here in terms of the nature of the fluid. So this particular calculation of the stress from the pressure gradient is fine. We, we, have not, we don't have to do anything with that, but we do have to address this assumption with the, the Newtonian uh, fluid to calculate shear rate. So with that in mind, what you really get from the instrumentation when you're measuring a non-Newtonian fluid is what we refer to as the apparent dynamic viscosity, where, as I stated, we have used this assumption um, to calculate the shear, shear rate, which we then use to calculate this apparent viscosity. And so this is where the correction is, is going to be required. But there's a straightforward way to handle this. Um, so 
Step two in the process then is once you've collected your data, and if you're dealing dealing with concentrated macromolecules, then quite likely um, you're going to have non-Newtonian behavior, and you'll want to correct the data. So to reemphasize um, the stress that comes from um, that's given from the the software doesn't require a correction. We made no assumptions about the nature of the fluid, just calculated from the pressure gradient along the flow channel. The shear rate, however, we did have the Newtonian assumption and we have to correct this. So how do we do this? Um, the, the correction has already been worked out. The Weisenberg Rabinowitz Mooney, uh, let's just call it WRM expression, can be used to take uh, the experimental data and correct and determine what is the actual shear rate. So to do this, we will just, um, <clears throat> and it looks like we're cut off here a little bit. I apologize. Um, so the top plot, as you can see, is viscosity versus shear rate. And we're looking at the uncorrected data is the blue data points. And what we need to do um, is correct the data in the shear thinning regime. We don't need to do anything with the data in the uh, Newtonian low shear plateau. Um, that data is fine uh, because in this case, the, the maximum shear rate would be at the wall um, and so the correction is not necessary because shear rate will just go to uh, lower values as we move into the center of the, the channel. Um, so to correct the data in the shear thinning regime, um, the lower plot, we basically replotted our data to be the log of this shear rate that we've calculated versus the log of the stress. And so from this, <clears throat> um, we can get, generally it fits nicely to a um, quadratic equation. Um, sometimes in very, uh, if you have shear thinning over very broad, broad range of shear rates, you might have to fit it piecewise or use a high order polynomial, but oftentimes, and in this particular case, the quadratic uh, fits uh, quite nicely and we can use that. So once we've um, taken our data, plotted the log of the um, Newtonian approximation for shear rate versus log of stress, um, we take the derivative, we get the slope of this line, which is what we use in the, the correction for the rectangular channel. And so this allows us to get, um, so we no longer have to use this approximation to the shear rate. Now we know what the true shear rate is. And from this, then we can calculate the true viscosity. So just using the definition of viscosity, using our stress, which is perfectly fine, no assumptions made um, about the fluid, nature of the fluid, divided by now our corrected uh, shear rate. So then that gives us uh, in the top plot viscosity as a function of shear rate. Now we have the red data points which are corrected with the WRM expression. So now the data is, is ready to use. Um, so now what we have to do is go through and decide um, how are we going to handle um, this particular data when it comes to predicting injectability. And by that I mean is we need to start looking at um, you know the parameters and see for our application, where do we fall along this curve? So in many cases, we could possibly fall on the Newtonian plateau, in which case we would use the Newtonian uh, derivation. However, if we're going to higher rates, then we would need to start to take into account the fact that this fluid is non-Newtonian. So now what we're gonna do before we get into actually calculating the, doing example calculations of the injection force, we're going to go through the, the equations for both of those cases, the Newtonian and, and the non-Newtonian. So, um, so let's just start with the, the general concept of the injection force. So if you have your delivery system, then this what we generally refer to as injection force. Some of our customers refer to it as the break loose glide force, whatever you call it. Um, we're just looking at the force on the piston that's necessary to um, initiate and sustain the, the viscous flow in the delivery system. Now, you will in, in practice have to somehow account for friction in the system, so friction mainly between the piston and the barrel. However, that's going to be highly system dependent and it's not something that we can calculate from our viscosity measurements. So um, as we move forward, when we present injection force, we're just going to be talking about that viscous contribution. But in reality, you will have some friction component. So what are, let's, you know, as we move forward to, to get the expressions that we will need for Newtonian and non-Newtonian cases, we need to identify a couple working equations that we're gonna um, revisit and, and handle accordingly. So the first being, um, you know, how do we generally define this 
this viscous contribution to the injection force. So this is going to be the, the pressure drop across the delivery system times the cross-sectional area of the piston. Um, and this particular pressure drop is going to be basically a series of the different zones. And although we're not going to do the calculation here, we have in some of our previous webinars and some of our previous application notes actually shown with uh, numerical values that we can, um, as a good approximation, we can assume that the pressure drop in the needle dominates um, the total pressure drop. And you can understand this by realizing that the pressure drop is going to be inversely proportional to the inner radius to the fourth power. So because the needle inner radius is at least an order of magnitude smaller than the other dimensions, um, it is orders, the pressure drop is orders and orders of magnitude higher. So as we move forward, we're really only going to focus on flow in the needle um, to get our estimate for the injection force. And as I stated, if you want to look at the numbers for some uh, typical syringe parameters, you can take a look at one of our, our previous webinars or I believe one of our application notes. Um, so then the other thing we need to do then, now that we know to calculate this viscous contribution to the injection force, obviously we're going to know what the cross-sectional area is of the piston. Now we need to handle what is the pressure drop across the length of the needle. So to do this, we're going to have to look at a force balance we're now we're looking at in this particular zone, so in the needle. So this pressure drop across the needle is going times the cross-sectional area in the needle is going to be balanced by the, the um, viscous force. So this will be viscous stress times the area within the needle that's wetted by the fluid. And as we know, the viscous stress is defined to be viscosity times shear rate. And this viscosity may or may not be dependent on the shear rate. So these two, two equations, um, this one here, and then the stress balance are what we're gonna be working with when we handle the Newtonian versus non-Newtonian case going forward. <clears throat> so the Newtonian case is pretty straightforward because it's a classical fluid mechanics problem to look at the flow of viscous fluid through a cylinder or a conduit with a circular cross section. So, um, so what we know for Newtonian fluids is that the viscosity is constant. It's not dependent on shear rate. And therefore, the velocity profile within the cylinder is um, parabolic. And it's, it's a well-defined function. So we can easily calculate what we have a nice analytical expression for what the shear rate is at the wall, just dependent on the volumetric flow rate and the radius, inner radius of the needle. So with this in mind, we can go back up to our force balance and calculate the pressure drop across the, the needle. Um, and then once we have this pressure drop across the needle, we can insert that into our force expression for the viscous contribution to the force. And we have an analytical approximation for this force, um, just in terms of parameters of everything we would know um, related to the delivery system, the radius of the piston, the needle, the length of the needle, the volumetric flow rate and the Newtonian viscosity. So this is um, quite simple to execute, you know, once you have your viscosity data and all of your syringe parameters. Um, and we will do some, we will show you some values for this towards the end, but um, so that this is something you would use if you have something that is fully Newtonian across all shear rates that you test, or if you know your application has a shear rate that falls on a Newtonian plateau. However, uh, that may not be the case because as we know, the needles have very small inner radii and can then, this can then lead to very high shear rates. So how do we handle uh, non -Newtonian, the non-Newtonian case in the, the syringe? Okay, so we, we still have the same working equations, um, but what we realize here now is that um, for non-Newtonian fluids, as we know, viscosity will now depend on shear rate, so it's not a constant. And so that means since the shear rate varies across the cross section, so the shear rate is zero at the center point and then becomes a maximum near the wall, at the wall, um, this means the viscosity will vary across the cross section as well. And what this means is that instead of the um, well-defined parabolic velocity profile for a Newtonian fluid, now we have something that's, that's distorted when we have a shear thinning fluid. And, will often look something uh, like the red dashed line that we have here. 
So what happens then is the um, center point region gets flattened a bit and uh, what happens is that the shear rate at the wall then is higher than what we would predict from the Newtonian expressions. So if we, um, so we need to correct in some way for this change in shear rate at the wall. So the Newtonian expression is not going to work. Now, just like we used the WRM correction to correct our data in the rectangular uh, slit, which is what our instrument um, is the basis of our instrumentation, um, there is a um, analogous relation for cylinders or, or conduits with circular cross sections. However, in that particular form, it's not very practical for what we're trying to do here. So what we are going to do is we're going to go back to sort of the origins of this expression where you, we start from the point where we're, we're deriving it and we're going to make some changes so that um, we have something that's much easier to handle and we can use our experimental data to get basically the shear stress at the wall. So if we can you know, get a, a proper expression where we can estimate from our data what the shear stress at the wall would be within the, the, the needle, then we can just insert that into our force balance. So instead of trying to look at viscosity as a function of shear rate, what we would do is just get the shear stress at the wall. So that, that is the goal, is to come up with a more practical expression um, rather than this particular form of the WRM correction. Okay, so, um, so we have a lot of equations here, but um, I, I, I just prefer not to dump an equation on you. Um, for those who are interested, I'd like to explain, and then once you're comfortable with that, then you can go ahead and move forward, use the expression. But it's just some fairly basic uh, math here that we're gonna go through to get to our final destination. Okay, so what we wanna do is find a way to determine what the wall shear stress is from our actual experimental data. And in that way, we can use that to calculate the pressure drop across the needle, and then finally calculate this viscous contribution to um, the injection force. So as I stated, we're gonna sort of start from the very beginning. So this is very basic. So what we have is the volumetric flow rate. Um, we, we get this by just integrating the velocity profile across the, the cross section of the needle. Um, so from the center point to the radius of the needle. Now, we don't know what the velocity profile is from our experimental data. So what we need to do is we need to do some rearrangements and substitutions to get something that we can actually work with. So the first thing we do uh, is we just do integration by parts. And so that changes our expression so that within the integral, um, we now have a uh, shear rate. So if you remember, shear rate is always defined as the um, velocity gradient perpendicular to flow. So in this case, the perpendicular direction to flow is in the radial direction. So now uh, we can, after the integration by parts, we now have a uh, shear rate in our integral. Um, so that helps because we have shear rate as part of our experiment, we have that data. However, we don't really know how shear rate varies with the radial position. Okay, so how do we handle that? So now what we do is we can go to, uh, you know, back to basics again, and from the, um, from the momentum balance or the conservation equations, uh, we can get a relationship for stress as a function of radial position. So we find that um, stress is linear proportional to the radius. Um, and in this case, this is stress at the wall and the uh, radius of the needle. And when we get this expression from the momentum balance, um, we're not making any assumptions about the nature of the fluid. So we're not using the Newtonian constitutive relationship. Um, we're just dealing with the, the stress. So this is perfectly valid to insert here. And when we do this, now we have something that we can relate to our data. So now within our integral, we have shear stress and, and shear rate. And so if we take the data that we looked at on some of the previous plots where we did the uh, correction to the non-Newtonian behavior, we can replot this so that we're looking at shear rate as a function of shear stress. And what we find is that over the range of our data, it fits quite nicely to a quadra quadratic expression. So basically we have that uh, shear rate um, is quadratic in terms of shear stress. So what we can do then, knowing that we can get our data in this form, then we can make one final substitution into our integral, which allows us to get a um, analytical expression for the shear stress at, at the wall um, as a function of um, parameters that we get from fitting our data and then also just the parameters of the needle and the volumetric flow rate that we want to deliver. So once we rearrange this expression, we have this one here, so it's just a quadratic equation 
where we can um, use the, the standard solution that's well known to solve for the, the um, shear stress at the wall. So this comes from you know, fitting our experimental data that we have um, and then knowing what the parameters are for our needle and how we want to deliver, what volumetric flow rate, flow rate we want to deliver at. So once we have that, um, we can now substitute the wall shear stress to get the viscous contribution um, to the injection force. Um, and then as before, it just also we would need to know the other parameters of our um, uh, syringe system. Okay. So now let's go back again to the shear rate, viscosity versus shear rate curve that we looked at before. So one of our non-Newtonian examples and see how we can utilize these expressions that we just presented. So, um, so what I've done here is looked at three different sets of conditions, um, potential conditions for a delivery system and delivery rate. And we're looking to see where they fall um, on our viscosity curve. And then we're going to calculate using the Newtonian assumption and then also the corrected assumption for non-Newtonian behavior. So I've picked some you know, somewhat representative values that we've seen when dealing with our, our customers' delivery systems. Um, and in this case, I've just varied the volumetric flow rate so that I'm varying the conditions within the uh, needle of the syringe. However, you know, this would apply equally well if you have some very fixed delivery rate, but you have some flexibility, for example, in needle gauge. So that would change the inner radius of the needle, which would also change the um, shear rate that the fluid's experiencing. So I just was trying to keep it simple by varying only the one parameter. So what do we see? So if we look at the first group of conditions um, and we look at what is the Newtonian estimation for the shear rate at the wall within the needle, um, we can see that it's uh, slightly less than 10,000, which falls at about this point on the data. So in this case, we're sort of at the edge of the Newtonian plateau, um, but it's likely that, you know, assuming Newtonian behavior is okay in this case. However, we can sort of prove that knowing that the, the expressions for the non-Newtonian situation. So if we correct our um, shear rate, uh, for the non-Newtonian flow, it is very close, slightly higher. Um, and then using the expressions that we just presented for the Newtonian viscous contribution to the force and the corrected contribution, we see that they're for all intents and purposes the same, uh, less than 1% difference. So in this instance, uh, for this set of particular set of parameters, because we really are um, still on or close to the Newtonian plateau, using the Newtonian assumption would, would work fine. However, if we're now wanting to say deliver at a higher volumetric flow rate, now this is going to, to shift things. And um, when we now start comparing the Newtonian approximation to what happens when we ac account for the shear thinning, now we start seeing more significant differences. Um, so the next point we're looking at here is uh, sort of at the end of our experimental data in the vicinity of 50,000 inverse seconds. And we can see that um, when we account for Newtonian behavior versus non-Newtonian behavior, the, um, it, the estimate for the viscous contribution to the injection force drops by about 15%. So, um, you know, the, the real injection force is going to be lower um, when we account for the non-Newtonian behavior. And then this becomes more extreme as we move further along the curve. Um, in the final case, we're looking at something where it's almost 30% difference uh, when we look at Newtonian versus non-Newtonian. Um, so, you know, when, when dealing with customers, when we talk about what is your threshold for, um, you know, a, an injection force, you know, if you have a particular threshold and, you know, if you miscalculate using the Newtonian assumption and you're 30% off in your, your prediction, then you could be rejecting, you know, a, a candidate that's, that's actually uh, usable and applicable for you. Uh, I will point out that uh, in this instance, we sort of went beyond the bounds of our experimental data and we were using uh, extrapolated data, but we haven't gone too far from the, the boundaries here and this should still be a reasonable uh, estimation. So with that in mind, um, I will now sort of uh, 
introduce a, a shameless plug for our um, analysis software because at the moment uh, in our analysis software we can it is pre-programmed to deal with uh, the Newtonian approximation for the injection force so at this point in time you can import data into this um, analysis package and it will calculate injection force as a function of your your viscosity and it's very easy to adjust the um, delivery parameters to see how that would impact the, the injection force. So if you really uh, are hoping to use a particular candidate and you have flexibility in how you will deliver, then this could be a very quick and easy way of seeing what conditions would, would work for that particular formulation. And with this in mind, um, you know, at the moment, the non-Newtonian uh, treatment isn't pre-programmed into the software, but if you know, we find that customers are interested in trying to, to handle that with their data, then this is cer certainly something that could be incorporated. So absolutely, please let us know um, is this, if this is of interest to you and we'll, we'll update it. It's sort of a continuous work in progress and always evolving. Okay, so just to quickly review, um, we always like to point out viscosity is not one number. And as you can see, um, depending on the particular conditions during your injection, uh, and the particular syringe parameters, you may need to be at a different point on the viscosity curve. And if you only have one value, um, you, you may predict things improperly. So then just to quickly go through the steps that you know, we would suggest when trying to deal with the injection force, you, know, you wanna establish, establish you know, what are the potential delivery parameters and then plan your experiments accordingly so that you can get data that's going to be relevant to, to that situation. And then if necessary, um, correct for any sort of non-Newtonian behavior so that your data is uh, in proper form, and then go ahead and perform the appropriate uh, injection force calculation, whether that be Newtonian, if your sample truly is Newtonian, or you're on the Newtonian plateau, or if you're off the plateau and you really need to consider uh, the non-Newtonian behavior. Um, so with that, I will uh, stop there and check to see if we have any questions. Okay, we have one question. Let me quickly read and then summarize it for you. Um, so we have a question. Uh, if the sample is non-Newtonian, how many shear rates should we measure? Um, ideally, you, you'd want to try to measure um, up to the where you think the the injection behavior would truly be, um, and then at lower rates to see you know where the the Newtonian plateau exists, um, and you want to have enough points to capture that transition, the the critical shear rate, the onset of shear thinning. Uh, so it kind of depends on how uh, many decades in shear rate you're measuring. I would recommend maybe five per, five points per decade. Uh, in shear rate would be adequate, um, but the, it could vary. So uh, let's see. Um, so we have a question about the Clarity software. Um, so this is our analysis software. So it, at the moment, can be used to analyze either MVROC data or Initium data. So if you have EmbryRock or Initium, you can export the data and import it then into Clarity and analyze from there. So at the moment, it is um, it is standalone, but you can use it for EmbryRock or Initium data. Okay, so then there's a question here about um, viscous heating and can this be a problem? So. It certainly can if you go to high enough rates. Um, however, I haven't seen it uh, 
become a problem when we're dealing with our particular model proteins in-house and rates up to in excess of say 100,000 inverse seconds. So up to maybe about 150,000 inverse seconds with our model concentrated protein systems, I have not seen any indications of viscous heating. Um, if you need to go well beyond that particular um, shear rate, then you certainly wanna look out for it and be cognizant of it, but it kind of depends on, uh, on how high in rate you're, you're going to be going. Um, let's see. So is the injection force under equilibrium flow conditions is another question. So when we do the calculation, we're assuming that it's, it's steady state. So we're not taking into account startup flow or, or transient behavior. So yes, um, it would be a steady state uh, approximation. So we're not really, and then there's sort of a follow-up here. What is the, the force at start? Um, so I think, you know, from what I've seen from experimental data from some of the customers, um, a big portion of that perhaps peak that might exist in the initial startup is related to static friction perhaps. So that's not the viscous portion. Um, although I'm, I'm kind of speculating a bit. Uh, so I think the, the peak that might come at start is more from static friction and our uh, information that we present is a steady state um, calculation. Okay. Um, I did have a couple more here. Let me jump back. So we have a question relating to, uh, I'm not sure, I'll, I'll answer it both ways because I'm not sure exactly what is meant exactly. Um, but the question relates to the drug delivery method is already established, um, but we haven't done any, uh, I think it's relating to compatibility with the, your actual measurements versus your um, you know, delivery process. And so I, I guess, you know, to answer the question, I'll just emphasize, you always want to look at, at, the, at the beginning, you want to understand what, how you anticipate delivering the product and then design your experiments to as best as possible um, measure viscosity that, in, in a range that, that is relevant. Um, and then, you know, if you have flexibility in your delivery method, then, you know, great. If not, then of course, uh, you know, formulation would have to be varied. Okay, I think the questions have slowed down. There is one more question about clarity and its compatibility with certain versions of Windows. Uh, I can't say for certain, we'd have to, you know, if, if you're interested in clarity and you're concerned whether it's compatible, definitely contact us and we'll check with the software group. I don't wanna misspeak on that topic. Okay, I'll just give another minute and while we're waiting just to see if any final questions uh, come in, I did want to point out that um, anyone who signed up and attend, actually, even if you didn't attend the webinar, anyone who signed up for the webinar will ultimately get a copy of the slides and a recorded version of the webinar. So if at some point in time later you have questions, um, you would have our contact information, please feel free to get in touch with us um, so we can answer any questions you might have that come up later. With that said, I think the questions have sort of stopped and we can finish up there. Again, thanks for joining us today and please contact us if you have any uh, thoughts or questions or suggestions. Um,
moving forward. Have a great day.